I had seen the UMass marching band once when they did Batman. I remember watching that circle at the center of the field that just opened up into the bat with, you know, the, the Elfman music and it. It was just, I was sitting there like, why am I a singer? I, why can't I be a part of that? Hello, and welcome to episode five of the Bandwagon podcast for the week of March 25th, 2024. On this edition of the program, news and notes from around the band world, including... News about the Penn State Blue Band gaining a new friend. A couple of thoughts about the names we call ourselves. A tiny disclaimer about why I talk about my old stomping grounds so much. And a conversation that suggests you can go home again. I'm your host, Rob Hammerton. Hello, bandwagon listener. These podcasts won't always have themes that permeate a whole episode. This week's episode, though, partly by means of a bit of planning and partly by way of the elements of the universe deciding to line up all at once, involves a through line. And that is references to and stories involving or told by people with whom I go back a ways. You may or may not care overly about that, but it strikes me that a lot of this episode, when I listen to it, is going to be like old home week. Voices and names and tales that send me careening backwards in time as if I had jumped through the Guardian of Forever. And for those of you who may be moaning enough with the Star Trek talk, oh, you don't even know. In particular, one segment is almost an apology for the fact that I go to the UMass well quite a bit, or at least I have in the first four episodes of Bandwagon. Actually, I never apologize for that sort of thing, but I do recognize that there may be listeners who have their own home band, and maybe it would be nice to hear about that sometime, too. Well, yes, and that's what my contact links are for the email and voicemail links. Absolutely, let's talk about your origin stories. Send me stories, tell me who I should have a conversation with next. But in the meantime, bear with me for one more week. Okay, now go find a read that doesn't have a crack in it, and away we go. Let's play the first strain. In this episode's first strain, news and notes from the band world. Dateline University Park, Pennsylvania. John Martinson, a venture capitalist from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, has made two gifts to the Penn State College of Arts and Architecture to support the School of Theater's Design, Technology, and Management program and also the Penn State Blue Band. Martinson has committed $600,000 to the School of Theater to improve technological and pedagogical equipment. He has also committed $300,000 to the Blue Band for equipment and uniform maintenance and replacement. As a result, spaces associated with each program will be named in his honor, the John H. Martinson Lobby of the Playhouse Theater and the John H. Martinson Equipment Room. Martinson has been a venture capitalist for more than four decades with investment interests that often focus on technology and education. And although he has no formal ties to the university, in Penn State, he has found an impactful partnership. In 2009, Martinson teamed with the Penn State College of Education to create the Martinson Family Foundation Grant in Science Education, which offers preparation in STEM education for K-8 through education majors. To build on that initiative, he committed $750,000 in 2021 to support STEM Between Us, a hybrid program that provides professional learning opportunities for current and future K-8 through teachers and creates STEM enrichment partnerships between the College of Education, school districts, and community organizations that serve students in Pennsylvania communities who have traditionally been marginalized in STEM. The success of that endeavor, Martinson said, has strengthened his connection to Penn State and led to campus visits where he immersed himself in the culture of the university. In addition to enjoying football weekends in the Happy Valley, he said he has discovered the vibrant and diverse arts community by attending theater productions and experiencing the excellence and tradition of the Blue Band. That's news and notes from the band world for this week. If you have a news item you think should be included in this segment, send me a link via email to heybandwagon at yahoo.com. We'll take a quick break now and meet you on the other side. You are invited to keep listening. Okay, let's pick it up at the second strain. In this week's second strain, a couple of thoughts about, well, what's in a name? 
Folks who know me will know that I am two things which have throughout my life set me on a path to be seen as well, the nerd in the room. And they are, in no particular order, Band and Star Trek. The band bit you knew. But what you haven't seen is my official fourth grade school photograph, which depicts my nine-year-old red-headed freckled self happily clad in an original series yellow Captain Kirk uniform shirt. Delta-shaped logo over the heart, the whole thing. And no, I'm not including that photo in this episode's show notes. To this day, I'm still not sure why my parents allowed that to happen, but there I am. Such a handsome fourth grade fellow who clearly did not worry about being bullied. Sorry, Mr. Shatner, maybe not that last part. And that same year, I joined the school band. I'm not sure what the third element of the nerd trifecta would be, but I was well on my way at age nine. Meanwhile, back here in 2024, I made an offhand reference early in the very first episode of this podcast, noting the similarities between being a Trek fan and being a band member, particularly our challenges in convincing the mainstream, larger world that being one of those is cool. Pointed ears or purple plumes, sousaphones or plastic phaser guns, it all kind of marks us as odd ducks. The trick is to revel in it regardless. But that's hard when the cool kids snicker behind your back especially when they're not so far behind your back that you can't hear them doing it. But what I got thinking about is how we win back the cool. Specifically, what we call ourselves. Ever since I got to college and was introduced to the term, I have happily referred to myself as a bando. I'm not sure exactly when or where that term first appeared in our lexicon, but I have wondered whether it started out as a term of derision rather than endearment. I've heard band people called bandies sometimes, and at least to my ear, it sounds a trifle derogatory. Now, if the people in your band call or call to themselves that, that is fine. I'm not judging, but everybody interprets sounds in their own particular way. Because I am such a hardcore Star Trek fan, I know that in the early days, when the original TV series had been canceled after three seasons and then a few years later found a new audience thanks to TV syndication, the fans of the show were referred to as Trekkies. Out here in the future, this term is actually part of the established lexicon and no one bats an eye. In fact, even non-Trekkies know who we're talking about when we invoke the word. But in the late 60s and early 70s, devoted fans of the series balked at that nickname. They thought it was demeaning. They much preferred to be called Trekkers. You hear the difference between Trekkies and Trekkers? I do, and I definitely get it. To their ears, as well as to mine, Trekkers did sound a bit more dignified, more serious. Two things. One. Both the band activity and the Star Trek universe are a lot of things, but dignified and serious, at least from the perspective of outsiders, may not be immediately seen as amongst them. Yes, Star Trek has told some terrific stories and made very wise commentary about important issues. And yes, music has been written for bands that is influential, groundbreaking, and aesthetically beautiful. But you gotta admit, for a start, in each case, the uniforms can be a touch over the top. But here's what happened sometime between 1973 and now. The Trek fans started to call themselves Trekkies. Maybe it was a case of shrugging their shoulders, throwing up their hands, and saying, fine, if you can't beat them, join them. But maybe it was a case of cleverly taking a term of derision and appropriating it in such a way and with such enthusiasm that it served to disarm the mockery. So if anybody out there does know the origin story, the etymology of the term bando, I'd be interested to know if it followed the same vocab evolutionary path as Trekkie did. Get in touch. Let me know. Send me an email. Leave a voice message. Hailing frequencies are open. Meanwhile, we'll pause for a moment and then fire up the trio section with a really fun conversation that you will want to hear. Live long and prosper. Okay, we're about to get into the trio section, but first, a quick note. Technology is neutral. It's what you do with it that makes it helpful or dangerous, right? This has been my mantra for a long time. Nuclear power or nuclear weapons? That's the idea. And the technology that we have to play with that makes these podcast things possible, I find wondrous and amazing, and every so often that technology decides that it's going to do what it wants to do. So you fire up the same apps with the same settings and the same setup, just like they taught us to do in science class, only change one variable at a time if you're doing an experiment. And just like we're taught in a whole lot of activities, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. All of this is prelude to an apology for the sound quality of this conversation you're about to hear. It was conducted on the Zoom teleconferencing platform, same as all the other conversations you've heard on the Bandwagon podcast so far, and yet it sounds as if we've gone back to the good old days of AM radio. So, with that in mind, it's the content of the conversation that makes it great, right? 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 Well, brace yourself for the sound of this, but also get ready to enjoy a fun chat. 
Here comes the tree. This week in the trio section, it's the first time on this podcast that I just set up a conversation with an old friend. I, I shouldn't say that. None of us are old at all. Um, a conversation with a long-standing friend and just let the recording technology run. And we think we know we're going to talk about, but as so often happens with band friends, oh, the places you'll go. So as it happens, this podcast was actually kind of built on an unexpected turn in a conversation that I had with exactly that kind of person recently. So I am pleased to be joined by a music teacher and a singer and a runner and lots of things, some of which have taken her to the stages of Tanglewood and Carnegie Hall. So she practices. Uh, welcome to the program, Beth Ann Curtis. Hi, Beth Ann. <laughs> Hi, Rob. This is the first time anyone's ever asked to chat about any of this with me. So this is exciting. So we kickstart. So this is probably going to be just about as formal as this session gets. But as I have done with a few folks here, I have a few lightning round band questions to pose for purposes of introducing you properly in a band context. So first, what's your primary instrument? And I'm going to be interested in how you answer this question. All right. My primary instrument is voice. That is my first love. It is what I studied. It is what I continue to use the most when it comes to performance. But then my secondary instruments, well, they're secondary in that I don't necessarily perform with them often, um, would be oboe. And then in college, because marching band bit me and oboe is generally not something you're going to find on a marching field, I joined the pit and wow did that kick my butt <laughs> when I first joined <laughs> I didn't even think I was gonna make it um and fortunately uh Tom Hannum said here take this keyboard home with you and practice all summer <laughs> and when I came back I was at least good enough that he allowed me to continue I have not known that many people whose first percussion ensemble experience has been in a Tom Hannum drum line but, and all I can think of is, wow. <laughs> I felt very honored that he was willing to give me the chance. So I didn't, uh, I didn't waste that chance. I realized even back then, like before, I didn't know a lot about him, but I knew that, you know, he was serious. And so I knew that to get that chance was probably uncommon and that I had better not squander it. So yeah, I spent a lot of time practicing and I made it. <laughs> well, clearly, when I first figured out who you are, oboe was not something I thought of because obviously, yes, we're marching, but but you sang a little bit in the Phantom of the Opera show, did you not? Yes, that was my very first marching band post high school experience. I had never even, oh no, I had seen the UMass marching band once when they did Batman. I remember watching that circle at the center of the field that just opened up into the bat with, you know, the, the Elfman music. And it, it was just, I was sitting there like, why am I a singer? I, why can't I be a part of that? <laughs> um, and then the next year when Phantom came up and um, I got asked to sing the Christine Dye part, I was like, this is unusual, but okay. Yeah. I'd like to give that a try. What's your current band related role? I am the South Hadley High School marching band director and the concert band director and the chorus director and the a cappella choir director and the theater director. <laughs> uh, no show choir yet, but we're working on it. And actually, I, I still work with the UMass marching band. Um, I still work with their vocalists. Which is something that has become much more of a thing lately. Yes. I can pretty much expect a call every year. One major difference that is probably obvious to even casual observers who've just been in the football seats for uh, for a while is during the George Parks time, there was singing in moments where it made sense. But uh, in, in the Tim Anderson era, the vocal content has become nearly ubiquitous. Uh, yeah, no, there's definitely um, a difference. But I also think that's a that's an evolution, a time evolution thing as well. You know, when we did Phantom and then Bill Bailey, these were these were the pioneering vocal things. And then over time, everything just kind of grows as, you know, as it does. And so here we are. 
it's entirely possible that the people from one era will look over at the other era and say, from the perspective of well, the way I remember it is the way it should be. And not necessarily. You know, I have to say not necessarily. I think I think the growth is, I think it's organic. And I, I appreciate the change and the adjustment. I don't always like change. Actually, I frequently dislike change. But with regard to vocals and electronics getting involved, I think if you leave that out, you're trapping yourself to be in the past. And there's nothing wrong with the past. I think it's great to pay homage to the past and occasionally do something the way they would have done it, because that's a great lesson for people too. Like, hey, it was very different. So let's let let's have you feel what that felt like. But you know, we've grown to this place, and I think we should embrace it. So, what bands have you been active with in your life, whether playing or whatever? I obviously did high school marching band, the Shrewsbury Colonials. Marching band for Shrewsbury at that time was not at all what I experienced at UMass. And it wasn't that we were a small band because for a high school band, we were pretty big, around 150. And I did play in the pit then too, but, you know, I had no lessons or knowledge or I was playing all wrong, but, you know, who cares? It was high school. But our director didn't write drill charts. Like we would just go up to the field and he'd say, okay, take 10 steps that way. And then you guys pass through each other. And, and it was slow and painful. Mm. And I thought I hated marching band. Like I was a cheerleader too. And I was always so like, I wasn't bummed out, but I was like anxious about getting out of my cheer uniform, which was cheerleading was so organized. And so, I don't know, our director was so on top of things. Like we were second in the state my senior year. So to go from that to marching band and put, you know, I'd run under the stands, change into my marching band uniform and come out. And I was just always so anxious about what was ha- going on behind me because it was such a painful process and everybody hated it. None of us hated being at the football game and none of us hated actually performing. We just hated the process of getting there. Drill by rote. Yes. Is hard. <laughs> I was grateful. I just had a, a marimba in front of me. Oh, I actually had a xylophone. So I was grateful I had a xylophone in front of me and didn't have to learn or not learn. I don't know. I don't know how they did it. I really don't. Thinking about and imagining, it, my, my brain is exploding. <laughs> and for 150 people. It's not like it was a band of 20. It was 150 people. And that's the thing. There were years we would go back and there would be an alumni band and George would stand on a ladder and, and, and sort of do that same sort of thing. But A, there were fewer of us and B, there wasn't that much to do. It was maybe fine four or five sets. And also, if you were older, you could listen longer, more, longer attention span, and you knew how to march. In high school, none of us knew how to march. Roll step? We didn't No, That was not a word that any of us had ever encountered. Horn angles? Nope, not a thing. So for Mr. Parks to stand and, and do that with a group of people that knew how to march, I mean, I'm sure he could have come to my high school and done the same thing with my high school, and we would have loved it. But again, he would have been working with a bunch of people that had never done it. But he knew how to do that. <laughs> What got you into playing a band instrument? Oh, that's my dad. He went to Boston Conservatory. He's a trombone player, um, and he became a middle school band director. And my first instrument was conducting. I had a baton, and when he was <laughs> practicing for you know finals and things, uh, I would stand right next to him and mimic everything that he did. So I guess really that's my first instrument. And then, you know, I would always sing with any jingle that was on the TV until I could be in church choir, which I started doing. Gosh, I was a cantor when I was like in second grade. But instruments, I started, he brought a French horn home one day because it needed some fixing or something. And I just thought that was the coolest looking thing I had ever seen. And so he, you know, tried to help me play it. And then I thought, this is the most psychotic thing I've ever (laughs) felt in my life. And it's, it's torturous. Um, So I said, you know what, I think maybe the flute would be better for me. Um, So I started flute before you could take it in public schools because my dad could teach me. I do wish I had enjoyed the French horn, though. 
because now as an adult, every time I hear a piece of music, I'm like, oh, I wish I could play the French horn. <laughs> <laughs> well, the subject that I've been curious about is one that I'm not necessarily unfamiliar with because it goes back either eight or nine or 10 years that I got to go out and hang out with your crowd and do a little bit of the South Hadley marching band experience. And it has occurred to me that you are in South Hadley now, as you mentioned, and you were in South Hadley, and there was a gap. There was. Tell me more. <laughs> I started in South Hadley in 1997, and I was recruited. The principal from South Hadley got in touch with me and said, hey, you've been brought to my attention, and I really think you should come and apply. And I, I almost wonder if that was Mr. Parks. I, to this day, do not know how that happened, how I was brought to his attention. But I was teaching in Springfield at the time. And so the principal in South Hadley said, please come and um, interview. So I did. And I got the job. And South Hadley at that point, so 1997, they were really wanting to build a program. They already had this great marching program. Tom Boats had been there for a long time. Um, Roger Farnsworth had been there before him. So great marching program, but they didn't really have a choral program. Tom did it for a little while, and then they had some other people in with mild success. And then my job was to have great success. That was, I had been charged with, you must make a great choral program. Okay. All right. I can do that. And so for, hmm, I would say, I think it was 97. So about four years we were building and we were getting bigger. We had, we were up to two choirs. Things were going great. And then administrations changed. And so I think this is maybe 2000 or 2001, the administration changes and all of a sudden we're not so interested in the choral program anymore. We're not necessarily interested in the marching band program either, but we know that they go out and they're great ambassadors for the school. So we're not going to touch that, but we're going to start cutting back on music and they cut my position completely. So it went to one, one teacher. So Tom Boats was now doing chorus again. And Tom said, I've had enough of that. And he went and got a job in Guilford, Connecticut. And so because the way things work, they had to offer the position to me. So I was like, well, of course, I, w I was just getting started and I wanted to keep going. So I took the position back. And so from 2001 until I'd say around 2009 or 2010, we were able to maintain the status quo and move forward a little bit. Sometimes there would be 1.4 teachers or we did get to two full-time teachers briefly. And then around 2011, every year, they were just chipping away at the program a little bit more and more and more. And finally, in spring of 2017, when they said um, the band position would still be full-time, but my position was going to go down to 0.4. And I, I, it just fell out of my mouth. And I said, well, then I'm not coming back. The vice principal who said that to me was like, really, you're not coming back. And I was like, really, I'm not coming back. Um, and I think that they thought that because I had invested so much time and energy and, and it was like my child, I think they thought I would just do that. I wanted to just do that, but I also knew that I couldn't wake up and look in the mirror and feel good about that. So I, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm done. I'm not coming back. And so that was spring of 2017. And in some ways, I think the universe, the universe knew that I would be terrible at teaching online because, you know, three years later, 2020, we're in COVID and technology is very important. And my technology is a piano or a tuner or sometimes Dr. Beat, which still I have challenges with. So to, to now go online and to have to teach that way, that would have been a disaster for me. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, left teaching. I had a real bitter taste in my mouth at that point. And so I became um, a server at a restaurant and made almost the same amount of money doing that as I did teaching. Huh. And, and I was just, I was, I was really happy. I didn't realize how much stress I had on me as a teacher until I left it. 
and and all of the weight of the world was no longer on my shoulders. And I would like walk around that restaurant on cloud nine with a big smile on my face. And people are like, why are you so happy? And you're, and I was like, cause what's the worst thing that can happen here? I can drop a plate of chicken. No big deal. I go get another one. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about so many things. So I, I just continued with serving for a while and then realized, yeah, this is great, but I'm not really contributing anything to the world here. I'm ready to like start contributing to something again. So I wasn't ready to go back to teaching. I still had a very bitter taste in my mouth. And so I started looking at UMass because there's so many things you can do at UMass. And ultimately, I did land in Eisenberg working for the marketing department. And I got to work with students there, which was really nice. Like I was I was an office manager, but I also got to work with the marketing club and students would come into the office and need help with things. So I got to do some of that. So that was nice. But again, that's very minimal contact. And I still, although I knew I was being very helpful to the people in my department, that's 11 professors and assistant professors and lecturers. It's a small group of people that I'm really helping. So I decided that I wanted to go back to teaching. Hmm. And I started looking and everything I applied for, I either didn't get an interview at all, or I would go to the interview and I would get a callback. Like every first interview I took, I went to the next round. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they would, after that second interview, they would call me back and say, hey, you're great, but you're just too expensive. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. We're here now, are we? Yep. Yeah. But one of those positions that I applied for, but did not get an interview for was local and the person who was teaching in South Hadley got that job. And so now the South Hadley position is open and I did see it advertised and I wanted nothing to do with it. I was like, no, I'm just going to do another year at UMass. But the people at South Hadley still knew me. Well, the secretary, <laughs> the office manager in South Hadley still knew me. And she had been a band parent when her children went to school there. And she... I don't know. I think she just felt like I would be a good fit at this point. Mm. So she called me and said, you know that we have a position available. And I said, yep, I do. <laughs> and she said, well, would you be interested in that position? And I said, nope, not at all. And, and she understood. And she said, I totally understand. And she said, can I just tell you a little bit about the position now? And I said, sure. So she told me. And at the end, I said, no, I'm still not interested. So I thought it would, had been put to bed. And then about I don't know, three or four days later, she called me again and she said, you know, we would really like you to apply for the position. The principal would really like you to apply. Would you at least consider applying? And I said, I can apply, but they're going to have to answer an awful lot of questions for me. Like it's going to be an interview of me, but I'm also going to be interviewing you all because mm -hmm. I don't have a, a good sense that things are going to go well. So I went and interviewed, I asked a million hard questions and I received what felt like honest answers. Like when they said, can you rebuild this program? We miss having show choir, we miss indoor percussion. I said, I can absolutely rebuild all of that, but are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? And the principal said, I'm willing to do it, but not all at once. She said, I can't add everything back in tomorrow. And I said, that's great because nobody's ready for it to be added in tomorrow, but we do have to start adding it back in slowly over time. And she said, I am absolutely prepared to do that. And she has held true to her word. Mm. I said, for this year, we're ready to start indoor percussion again. She said, great, let's make it happen. And here we are. We're heading into that season right now. And it turned out not to be indoor percussion this year. We didn't have quite enough kids for the percussion side of it, but we had more than enough for the guard side of it. Oh. So we're doing indoor guard this year. And I can't wait to see them. Everyone's having a great time doing that. So, so yeah, I'm back and I, I feel very supported by the new administration. There's a new principal. There's a new superintendent, assistant superintendent. We have the same vice principal, but now there's two of them. And our current vice principal is awesome. He's just, he's in such a great place. He's always so willing to help. I, it's just, it's a, it's a completely different school. The culture is just very different. Mm. 
I am interested in hearing that the indoor guard became a thing because when I hung out for preseason camp this past fall with the South Hadley Tiger Pride marching band, there were four in the guard. And how many of them had prior experience? Zero. That's what I remember. <laughs> so that, yeah, is, zero. that is that is perhaps, I mean, twice zero is still zero. So you can't say this. It's, I don't know how many times more impressive that is that indoor guard is happening. But And they are loving it. They are just absolutely loving it. I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think what happened is it was very hard to find guard instructors. And the two people who did band after I left in 2017 were having a hard time getting an instructor. So I think they eventually just said, all right, you know what? We're not going to have a guard this year. So for four years, I think they didn't have a guard. And so when I said, well, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to have a guard. And that's just the way it is. I'm not doing marching band guardless. So I went and got my friend Rachel to come out of retirement. I say that like she's, you know, 70 years old. She's not. She's like 30. But she came over and the kids just loved her and mm. wanted to be around her. Mm. And that made all the difference. So, yeah, we have 10 in the Winter Guard. She came back to it and you came back to it. And Wes Parker also came back. Mm. And you also came back. It was like I put the band back together. <laughs> <laughs> if Beth Ann says jump, you ask how high. Oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> There are some conversations where you can see themes developing and then there are other conversations they just go where they're going to go. But it feels like there's, a, there, there's an element of returning to things in here, having been at South Hadley and then getting back to it. And I didn't know, uh, there were timeline things that I had never known anyway. We both were at UMass for however long that that was. And now you are back with the Miniman Marching Band again. I am. Um, I was always kind of peripherally there but usually in mid-august someone lately it's been ian will get in touch with me and uh say hey we've got the vocal auditions coming in so i'm going to send them over to you and you can check them out and let us know your thoughts and so i do i i listen and i say well these this is what i think and then you know they go and do what they think but they certainly have uh taken what i said into account then we set up times for me to go and work with those vocalists because it has become such a part of what they do. You can't just leave them out there in the wild yeah. because they need someone to focus on them specifically and say, all right, you know what? We we're, we can't hear anything here. We need to fix this or, or the words are coming across oddly here. Like one of the words they needed to say something about a shirt, but it was not coming across as shirt. And so I was like, okay, we we need to fix this. We we need to work on the diction for this word because I don't think you're saying what I know you're saying what you're supposed to be saying, but I don't think anyone's hearing it that way. <laughs> and as with any section, the percussion get their people to help them, and the guard get their staff to help them, and every section needs a set of ears and uh, and and a gentle advisor. And why not vocals and with the capacity for vocals being part of the outdoor band thing, like they never were. To me, I hadn't thought, I hadn't thought of this specifically in this way, but it makes sense to, it doesn't make sense to just have vocalists with nobody looking after them. Or at best, somebody behind the soundboard who, Absolutely. who, who might have ears, but whose training is not necessarily in singing. And so... And I think the other interesting thing is there aren't a lot of vocalists that have marching band experience. Hmm. Singing... Singing with Tango at Festival Chorus and the way that you do that is very different than the way that you sing on the football field. And I always have to keep that like, okay, who am I working with? Am I working with my high school choir? Because I have to work with them this way. Am I working with the UMass vocalists? Because this is outside and this is mic'd and it changes when you put it in the stadium and all of those things you have to consider. So a choral director who's never entered a football field would um, take a little bit of time to get used to it, how it would be different. What sorts of things do you listen for that you suspect a choral education major might not? I certainly, well, like I said, I listen for the words because outside the way that you say things has to be a little different than the way you say things inside. And then I have to watch the performers because it's marching band after all. 
you know, it's, it's all about the vis. Mm. And so, yes, you have to sound good, but you also have to look amazing while you're sounding good. Mm. And you have to look amazing to the people in the last row, just as much as you have to look good to the people in the front row. So that's another piece that we spend a lot of time talking about. And the other thing is mic technology. I think a lot of choral directors don't don't think about that. And I didn't either at first until I realized, oh, the way I use this thing really matters. Okay. But so I have to spend time teaching them. My favorite thing is, no, you don't have to sing at 100% volume into the microphone. We need to let the microphones do the work for you. Because mm. if you try to sing over the band, every time we mic you, it's going to be different. And also you're going to lose your voice. So a lot of mic technique goes into it. It's one of those things that I feel like was obvious, but I didn't think of it until it was described to me. And now it seems obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, it, it, it took time for it to be obvious to me. It was a new thing when I started doing it. And, you know, I had to go stand in all different places and it took me, it took me a long time to learn it. But now I've mostly learned, but I still learn new stuff all the time. Isn't it intimidating for a chorus person? A person does chorus for a few reasons, but one of them is that they like the camaraderie and being one voice of many. And when you put a mic in front of them, We've taken that away. All of a sudden, you are not one voice of many. You are one voice. And it's really intimidating. <laughs> it's not unlike when you've got the camera down low on the sidelines at a bowl game halftime, and they focus strictly on that baritone player. And that baritone player is not going to be proud of that moment, and it's going to be immortalized on YouTube forever. Forever. Or now, in the videos that go up on YouTube, where everybody has a GoPro and the drum corps second soprano, or sorry, shows my age, the second trumpet slaps the <laughs> GoPro on and you hear them playing and no, they're not sustaining that chord all the way through and no, they're not exactly, the intonation isn't great all the time because we're humans, but you step back to row Z and it sounds like Carolina Crown is Carolina Crown with perfect everything and perfect intonation and attack. Perfect and everything for sure. Just, yeah. So to slap that mic in front of a person who has has no experience with it and has no comfort with it. I think, and I say this with all the love in the world, I think there are tech people who don't realize that at all. I think you're right. There are tech people who may be used to cover band singers who are used to doing this sort of thing. People who are used to interacting with, with microphones and, and know how to navigate that. I'm prepared to predict that a large percentage of the, of, of the people who are very good at placing microphones and whatnot do not have any idea of the psychology that's happening inside the heads of the people who are <laughs> near those mics. They would only have that if they had done it themselves. That's why it's good to be on both sides of something. Then you've got all of the perspectives. Your training, but more importantly, your experience is the thing that I would judge makes that successful where you are. Absolutely. Before we finish up, let me hit you with some lightning round band questions that sound less like they're part of a tax form. Okay. <laughs> So what's one of your favorite pieces of band music that you've played, outdoors or indoors? Well, my guilty pleasure piece is Brass Machine. I loved playing Brass Machine. I was on the low end of the marimba, and I just loved the do, 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 do. And I just got to play it over and over. I, it was groovy. It was so fun to just be in that groove. And then to have all the trumpets behind me, like, doing their trumpet thing. Um, as a soprano in, in the real world, I appreciate trumpets because we're the same people. Um, <laughs> and I loved in concert band the Holst for Sweet Knee Flat. Mm. Love it. I could I could play. I can't play it very well anymore. Some of it's too hard for me now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but back when I could play my oboe that well, uh, I just loved playing that piece. Absolutely loved it. Flip side, uh, what's a piece of band music that you haven't played but you would like to? Uh, Apocalyptic Dreams. It's, uh, who heard it? I heard it at South Hadley uh, back when Tom Boats was the band director and back when uh, South Hadley kids could play level five and sometimes level six music. They played this apocalyptic dreams thing. And I remember sitting in the office just listening to it, wishing that I could be part of it. It's, it's three movements. I think it's by Gillingham. The movements are all completely different and there's beautiful moments and then there's really big sort of scary moments and i just it's a great piece of music and i would love to play it someday 
Is there a band that you'd love to perform with that you haven't, either because you're not the right age or not in the right place or don't live in the right century? I would love to have been a part of the, I think it was 1991 Star of Indiana. That was the year they did Pines of Rome. Isn't that interesting? You're not the first person on this podcast to say that. How incredible. <laughs> to me, it makes total sense, but I'm just, I'm just interested in why people feel that way. Interestingly enough, the first memory I have of watching that is The Guard. Just watching the incredible, yeah, the spinny things with all the, like there were no lights on it, but because of the mirrors on it, when you would spin it. So yeah, that caught my attention. But the drill, is that Zingali? I think it was. The drill was amazing. When they did the, at the end, they had the cross in this direction and then, and then the cross in this direction. You want to talk about writing drill by rote or on the fly. That was, I think, never really written down. But again, you have people who were very, very good at their jobs down there on the field. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the guard and that, and then just the sound, the wall of sound. In 1991, that wall of sound was something I had never encountered before. And you heard it live. And I heard it live. And I just, I was like, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> this is getting to be one of my favorite questions. Tell me one of your favorite band stories. You know, I don't think it's possible that I have a favorite band story. I think that what makes especially marching band so special for me is not any one big story. It's all of the the little things, the going to Brugger's at you know, right when they open and getting all of the bagels for your best because you're the best mom or singing non nobis with the whole band and the skies are about to open up in deluge and you have to run as fast as you possibly can to the Mullen Center so that, you know, the woodwinds don't die or singing bus songs. Oh, my goodness. Bus songs. Who, who would have thought that that was an important thing? Oh, it's so important. I don't even, do they do that anymore? I don't know, but I loved them. Or the most important moment for me ever was at Colt Stadium when Mr. Parks was um, talking about his dream. And he mm -hmm. basically said that we were his dream. I mean, the whole band in that moment, almost like, we, we could have cried a river instantly, except we knew we had to go on the field. Yeah. And I was a TA at that point. So like, I wasn't his dream. At that point, it was, you know, the kids in the band that were the dream, but I still felt like part of that. So it's all of those things put together that are my favorite story. Any one of them alone doesn't have as much foundation to stand on. It requires all of them. And have you got a favorite band life lesson or a bit of wisdom that you found useful outside of band? Um, always. You never get a second chance for a first impression. That is something I say to my students all the time. Especially this year, because we were we went back to U.S. bands. We we did U.S.S.B.A. when I was there, and then they switched and went to MICA. And when I came back, I said, "No, no, no I'm going back to to U.S. bands." And so I had to constantly remind my kids, "Hey, no one's seen South Hadley in five years. They don't have any clue, and we're never going to get a second chance for our first impression. So you have to go in there and give everyone the best impression possible." Mm. And just in general in life, because I might never meet that person again. And what if the only impression that person has of me is that I'm a flake or that I, I don't bring a pen to an interview or little things like that. Beth Ann Curtis, I'm so glad we had this time together. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. I'm really grateful. I spend a lot of time talking about choir and working on my choir stuff, but I never really talk about marching band stuff. With regard to me, you know, I'm, I always talk about other marching bands or drum corps or whatever, but I never really get into how I ended up where I am. So that was kind of fun. And may you and that South Hadley crew continue to treat each other well. They're phenomenal kids. They always have been. Always. I've met them. She's not lying. <laughs> well, thanks so much for making the time. My pleasure. Okay, one last break, and then we'll head for the finish line. Thanks to you, listening out there, for staying with me. Here comes the dogfight. 
This week's dogfight is not another band-related internet rabbit hole of the week. Just when you thought you had the rhythm of this podcast down, he changes his mind. Yeah, but if things get too predictable... You wouldn't want my life to get boring, would you? If you've been listening to Bandwagon from the beginning, thank you again. But you may have noticed quite a few references to the university band program where my love of band got supercharged. That's the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and its Minuteman marching band. And you may have noticed quite a few references to the Minuteman band's legendary director, George Parks, both from me and especially from my interview guests. And whether you're an alum of that program or an alum of the George N. Parks Drum Major Academy or not, especially if you're not, you may be wondering, is this podcast ever going to venture bravely into territory that doesn't constantly talk about that? The plan is yes, because obviously the larger band world is, well, larger. Otherwise, I might have named this podcast The Pale Moon's Silvery Spell, or Massachusetts Yours and Mine, or Mr. Parks' Wild Ride. <laughs> to jumpstart this thing, I will admit I took advantage of the willingness of some old and new friends from the UMass and DMA worlds. And in publicizing the podcast, I first talked it up on the old Facebook machine, and if you were to make a Venn diagram of all the various spheres of my life, public school, summer arts, college band, professional career life, church gig... And those Facebook friend Venn diagram circles were sized relative to the sheer number of people in them? Well, the UMass and DMA circles would rather dominate the landscape. There are other circles specifically related to my band life that would be quite large too. Delaware, Boston University, Holy Cross for starters. And they will get lots of attention as well as this goes forward. But pound for pound, UMass is still the beast in the room. So, for my Delaware and BU and Holy Cross friends, and for anyone else who lives in one of those non-UMass, non-DMA circles... If you're still with me, be reassured, your day is nigh. But, I guess, do forgive a fella for falling back on the band program wherein he kind of grew up, and which gave me lots of opportunities to get involved in the band world such that I was able to connect with other band programs and make lots of cool friends who live in those Venn diagram circles. We've all got that band, which, when push comes to shove, we identify as our origin story, which we call home. And that one's mine. Okay, one last pause, and then we'll wrap things up for this week. Thanks for continuing to listen. To wrap up this week, let's take the coda. For the coda this week, a follow-up request to my plea of a couple weeks ago. In the coda of episode three, I said I was looking for listener contributions. I mentioned that, well, it's April Fool's Day coming soon, and even though that's not my favorite holiday, nonetheless, I am all in favor of funny stories. So many band memories consist of humorous moments, if we're doing it right. So, again, here's my request. Tell me a funny story from your band experience. It can be from a performance, a rehearsal, or some other environment. See if you can keep it family-friendly, because this is a family podcast. But I'd love to put together a segment full of your best stories for April Fool's Day. If the story is shorter than 90 seconds, you can tell it vocally by going to speakpipe.com slash heybandwagon and recording a message. Or you can type up the story and send it in an email to heybandwagon at yahoo.com. That's Bandwagon for this week. Thanks, as always, for downloading and listening. Bandwagon was written, researched, and produced by your humble host. Musical interludes were produced by Hammerton Media, from source material largely by John Philip Sousa. You can listen to more episodes at our website, heyband.podbean.com. Please give me feedback, be polite, but let me know what you like and what you think might change. Tell me your best band story or suggest a topic for a future episode, whatever you like. You can do that using our email address, heybandwagon at yahoo.com. Or leave us a 90-second voice message by going to speakpipe.com slash heybandwagon. Be aware that we do reserve the right to include your message on the podcast unless you say otherwise. All those contact links and links to our news items, conversation topics, and my interview guest, Beth Ann Curtis, can be found in our show notes. Please share the show on social media, and thank you for that. If you enjoy this podcast, get someone else to listen as well. As it turns out, word of mouth is the best recruiting tool. And to keep up with us every week, subscribe to Bandwagon on the Podbean app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please give us a five-star review. It really helps other people to find the show. For now, take care, stay in touch, stay in tune, and we'll do this all again next week. I'm Rob Hammerton. Detail, fallout. Fallout.